A very good morning to you my dear sisters and brothers and welcome to Carmelite reflection on the day's readings Let us begin our reflection invoking the name of the Trinity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Dear yes, friends today is the 3rd of March and we are celebrating the 3rd Sunday of Lent And for the gospel reflection we have the famous episode of cleansing the temple from john chapter 2 verses 13 to 25 let us then meditatively and reflectively listen to the gospel reading a reading from the holy gospel according to john the passover of the jews was at hand and jesus went up to jerusalem in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip up cords he drove them all out of temple with the sheep and oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and he told those who sold the pigeons Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, "Zeal for your house will consume me." So the Jews said to him, "What sign do you show us for doing these things?" Jesus answered them, "Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up." The Jews then said it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in 3 days but he was speaking about the temple of his body when therefore he was raised from the dead his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken now When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man the gospel of the lord praise to you lord jesus christ dear brothers and sisters during one of the conferences on religious cleansing the resource person asked the floor how many of you believe that confrontation could be healthy and even loving and has the potential to change us into better persons all hands went up he questioned how many of you believe that confrontation could be healthy and even loving and has the potential to change us into better persons so everybody raised their hands and then the resource person continued with the second question how many of you would like to be confronted this way and then no hands were to be seen all hands came down well we are invited to be confronted by jesus today a confrontation that can bring that is healthy a loving and that can bring a potential change in our lives now this is a confrontation what could be understood as a religious cleansing recently there has been a wave of every possible physical cleansing there is a juice cleanse a liver cleanse a colon cleanse and countless ways to clear our bodies from impurities we have something called physical detox which includes distilled water with lemon it also includes stretching i mean yoga intelligent breathing eating organic stuff plant based diet 
intermittent fasting, sufficient rest, enough exercise and sweat. And we are all serious about it because we don't want to accumulate impurities in our bodies. Rather, we want to flush them out. Jesus today is reminding us of a cleansing of the soul. Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem at the time when people would be normally cleaning up their homes and their lives. They would be doing their best to get rid of an, any type of physical or spiritual leaven that would be considered unclean or unholy. They were to use this time to wisely prepare themselves to fully celebrate the great Passover. This sets the backdrop of what Jesus is about to do and declare. He is going to rid the house of God from sin in preparation for the Passover. Now, the scale of activities that is at hand in Jerusalem, especially in and around the temple, is hard to imagine. Some estimate that the permanent population of Jerusalem at that time might have been around about 80,000 people. But during the Passover festival, there were around 300 to 500,000 who came from all the surrounding regions. Coming from foreign lands had two practical needs, animals and currency. These people were coming in front, coming, coming in from all over the Roman Empire and it was not practical for them to bring their animals with them for all from all that distance. So, animals were sold in Jerusalem that could be used for sacrifices. In addition to that, the Old Testament required that each one pay a temple tax of half a shekel and it had to be paid with a certain type of acceptable coin. Therefore, for many who came from outside the city, there was a need to change their money into temple currency. In fact, there was certain legitimacy in what they were doing. But the spirit behind what was going on was anything but legitimate. These priests and merchants had a monopoly on all this business. The animals had to be inspected and approved by the priest before they could be offered. These priests often rejected animals that pilgrims may have brought from home and it forced them to go to the merchants and buy animals for an acceptable sacrifice. Exorbitant prices were charged for such animals. Exorbitant fees were charged for exchanging the money. Well, the temple took on almost an appearance of a fun fair or amusement center. In our language today, carnival atmosphere. The temple area was filled with advertising vendors and stinky display bars, barns, and all of this infringed and overtook the very purpose of prayer and spiritual devotion. Now, how could Jesus, who considered temple as his father's house, a house of prayer, just remain silent and overlook such abominable and disgraceful gestures? He immediately turns violent, but for a good and noble cause. Well, this is dramatic. At the height of activity that is taking place in the temple and crowds moving up and down, Jesus physically used force to clear away animals, to turn the tables of money exchange that sent money flying and turn the tables of the religious leaders who were in authority over it all. What is Jesus doing? He is confronting ultimate corruption driving away all who are using God's provision for personal gain, chasing all who are using religion for personal profit or power. My dear sisters and brothers, what we must realize is that what Jesus confronts in this exchange, he confronts in all of us. Many today say they don't trust institutional religion and that can make sense given that institutional power can provide and make space for abuse at different levels. But the heart of the issue is not the institution, 
but the nature of our disposition for abuse and misuse that runs in all of us. Now, in the former days, God dwelt among his people in the temple. But with the coming of Jesus, it is no longer only through the temple that we approach God. It is through Jesus that we pray, through Jesus that we receive forgiveness and atonement. So, where is God's house in our time? Some make the correlation with church buildings and structures. There is the common view that church buildings are the modern version of the temple. But that's not true. In truth, the temple of today, the place wherein God dwells, is you and me. And St. Paul understood this mysterious truth long back when he said, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? The passion that Jesus had for the temple that day, he has that same passion for all of us and every day. Brothers and sisters, we recently began what is traditionally been known as the Lenten season. The corruption which Jesus encounters in the gospel today becomes an opportunity for us to consider the ways in which our own self-serving desires can compete with the works of God. Some may consider this situation and think it is only an indication meant for those who might set up shops in the church. But there are many ways in which we may bring our self-serving desires to compete with the glory of God. When we come to the temple and worship, only what we like, we are in a wrong place and the temple is serving a wrong purpose and the temple has lost its purpose. Well, friends, there are a couple of lessons that we can learn from the temple cleansing episode. First, always pray and praise. What I mean is, we should pray and praise when we are in the house of the Lord. We should pray and praise every day in our lives, no matter where we are. The Lord has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He is our helper through, through all of our life's trials. We pray and he answers with wisdom and peace. Let us come boldly to his throne of grace where we receive his mercy when we need it most. Secondly, people before money. We should always remember, friends, that people come before money. Helping the hurting people who are praying for help means much more than making money. Donations to churches are important to keep them running and they are and they need to be need to run in order to equip believers to live rightly. However, these efforts shouldn't be put above helping people. When we seek to love our neighbors, it keeps us from committing sin. When we don't love our neighbors, we become jealous, angry, or bitter, and therefore capable of committing even the most horrendous sins. Love really does cover a multitude of sins, said St. Paul. The most important commandments have love at their base. Love God wholeheartedly and love your neighbor. The third lesson, the real temple is you. Remember that Jesus is much bigger than any building on this earth. His agenda goes forward when his believers walk in his ways, praise, thank him and reach out to help their neighbors. When we accepted Jesus' way of salvation, he deposited his spirit within our hearts. So, let's live differently. Let's live for the Lord. Just like Jesus didn't like the corruption of greedy money exchangers in his temple, he also doesn't like it when we allow the po pollution of this world get into us. Self-care has become a buzzword of late. However, if we place too many emphasis on ourselves, it's not a good sign. Let us take care of the temple of our body that houses the Holy Spirit. Let us protect our body, mind and spirit and make them always healthy. And the fourth one, God's righteous anger. The last lesson from Jesus cleansing the temple is that God has righteous anger. When people continue to do what is evil in the Lord's sight, his anger is provoked and eventually he steps in. God holds back from showing his anger because of his loving mercy and kindness and forgiveness. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy 
as he waits for people to stop their rebellious nature and come to him for pardon and mercy. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he won't wait forever. Eventually, full and complete justice will have to come forth. Dear brothers and sisters, the holiness of God is being debased by becoming merely a means to serving ourselves. Perhaps we begin to look for a little profiting of our own, a chance for attention, and we get frustrated when we don't get the attention that we seek or want. Jesus seeks to cleanse us of whatever is corrupting us. He is waiting and is wanting to detox our souls in order to restore us to our holy and whole purpose, to bring us back to God and to true devotion and holiness of life. Let us then welcome and accept this initiative so that we are able to experience the real glory of God and the power of His resurrection on Easter Sunday. Let us wind up our reflection with a short prayer. Lord, you teach us that we can really worship you only in spirit and in truth. Amen. The psalmist realizes the value of God's law and precepts. The commandments are meant to provide life for those who follow them. The psalmist describes the results of those who keep their end of the covenant relationship and obey God's commands. Refreshed souls, wisdom for the simple, rejoicing hearts and enlightened eyes. Doing the will of God is more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. Let's pray that psalm now. Your response? Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The decrees of the Lord are steadfast. They give wisdom to the simple. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. The precepts of the Lord are right. They gladden the heart. The command of the Lord is clear. It gives light to the eyes. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. The fear of the Lord is pure, abiding forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are all of them just. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. They are more to be desired than gold, than quantities of gold. And sweeter are they than honey, than honey flowing from the comb. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Pray for God's blessing now. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank Reverend Father Ratan Almeida, for sharing his reflection with us today. And we remember Leo Mathias from Anderi, Mumbai, Lolita Mathias from Anderi, UK, Nisha D'Souza from Malad, Mumbai, Theo Breton D'Souza from Permanur, Mangalore, Santosh Rebello from Kulshikar, Mangalore, who are celebrating their birthdays. Wish you all a happy birthday. God bless you. And we pray for the departed soul of Bella Fernandez from Mumbai, Nancy Moses from Sharjah, Valerian Rodriguez from Bangalore. May the Lord grant them eternal rest. That's all for today, my dear friends. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.